Good morning. My name is Tanaz. I'm uh, the pharmacy manager at Arizona Care Network, a uh, pharmacist by trade. I'm here today with Dr. Amit Mehta. Uh, he is um, a, um, a uh, physician at Premier Hematology and Oncology in North Carolina. He's also a faculty member at Duke University, specializes in blood disorders. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, uh, Dr. Mehta. Um, we can go ahead and jump in and just get started. Um, thank so you, Tanaz. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me uh, join of the course. podcast. Thank you for coming on. Uh, I, I'm sure you're very busy. Um, can you just get, get started and tell us a little bit about um, these terminologies that may be a, a little bit um, scary for people, VTE, DVT, uh, PE, they kind of all tie into the same group per se. So if you can just explain a little bit for me. Yeah, no, it's a, I think it's a very important topic and one that is sometimes not well understood, you know, to your point. And so all these terms, and I can elaborate on what they mean, but all these terms are different ways of saying in a general sense, blood clot. And blood clots in a human body uh, can be quite dangerous, as of course you know, and uh, depending on the audience's background, different individuals, I mean, you may have experienced it personally or in your family, but blood clots can be very dangerous. And there are many different types of blood clots. So they call them by these different uh, initials or acronyms So you'll see like when you look stuff up on, uh, you know, if you're somebody just in the public, uh, looking stuff up on Google or wherever it may be, but just to address like the ones you mentioned and some of the ones that may be heard commonly uh, when you just read stuff uh, on the internet and whatnot. So DVT means deep vein thrombosis, which is just a fancy medical term, meaning it's a blood clot that is somewhere in the body, typically in the leg. One of the legs is usually where it is. Uh, PE is a pulmonary embolism, which is an, again, a medical term for a blood clot that's hitting one of the, or blocking one of the blood vessels affecting the lung. And VTE is venous thromboembolism. So again, these are all like medical kind of a, a jargon, you know, uh, and uh, to your point, Tanaz, is that this is why it can be quite confusing. Like, what does it mean? But venous thromboembolism is a general term, meaning a blood clot in a vein somewhere in the human body. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, that clarification. Um, so what... Um, what uh, what demographic of patients do you typically these see these disorders or these issues and um, who should uh, be on the lookout or just to uh, you know who should be uh, worried about it per se? Yeah, I, I, so I think the big concept to understand for anybody in the public is there are two fundamental buckets of who can get a blood clot. One is people that have some kind of genetic condition, some kind of family risk factor inherited gene that can lead to a blood clot happening. The second group, which is the much bigger group, is a blood clot happens because of other reasons, not because you have some kind of genetic predisposition, but just because it can happen. And I can elaborate on what some of those things are, but those are the two big like areas. So in terms of who's at risk, so first of all, if you have a family history, like if somebody has a history of blood clots in their brothers or sisters or mom or dad or grandparents, usually immediate family, not like a distant relative, but uh, if you have a history of blood clots in the immediate family, then it's worthwhile to ask your doctor uh, or you know the clinic that you go to about should you be considered for evaluation for a possible family genetic risk of blood clot. Just so you know, as a patient, as a person, that, well, do I have to worry or not worry? You know, so that's like the basic thing I tell patients that, you know, you want to know, just so you understand, the more we know kind of proactively, the better you can be educated about, okay, well, do I have to worry about myself or am I more like a normal risk person like anybody else in the general population of the country? So that's one part, and I can pause for a second if you want and go into the second kind of big group. But that's great because um, thank you so much for pausing to for me to ask any questions. Um, that's great. So basically, take an active role in you know, um, and that was the, one of the reasons why we started doing these videos is for people to have enough information to um, get triggered to take an active role in their own health. So that's great to know those two factors. 
Um, are there any diseases or any health conditions that put you more at risk for these conditions? Yeah, gr a great question. And this is also one of these things that a lot of people worry about in general when they come to me for like a consultation type of thing. So the like I was saying that the second like much bigger group are people that don't have a genetic condition or inherited family kind of condition. It just happened because of other factors. And those other factors, you know, to your question are there are a, a list of reasons why somebody can get a blood clot even without some kind of genetic factor. So the there are many of them, but like the uh, some of the key ones are number one, people that have uh, some kind of issue that they can't be as mobile. So they're sedentary a lot, maybe because of a medical condition, like maybe you have uh, severe hip problems or back problems and walking or exercising is quite difficult because of those limitations physically. So uh, relatively not able to kind of get the blood going as you like, you know, move and walk around and exercise when you can't do that for some medical reason, uh, bad arthritis, you know, whether rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, those kind of conditions that cause relative, you know, difficulty in getting around, uh, that can be one risk factor. Secondly, people that have chronic infl inflammation disorders, like chronic autoimmune conditions. So people that have uh, lupus, psoriasis, you know, all these kind of different chronic conditions that can cause inflammation in the body. And that inflammation with inflammatory conditions, autoimmune diseases, these kind of conditions that cause inflammation, the inflammation triggers blood clotting. That's kind of like an on switch for blood clotting. So people that have chronic, you know, active autoimmune diseases, if you have a, if you have an autoimmune condition and it's totally stable on medication, your risk is fairly low, like fairly normal. But if you have a condition that's pretty active, like somebody has bad active rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriasis, Sjogren's disease, there's like a huge list of these things, of course, as you know, Tanas, um, but they can have this happen. The third factor are people that have had surgeries recently. So, uh, and this is usually not like a minor procedure, but somebody that has a more bigger surgery, cardiac surgery, lung surgery, abdominal surgery, you know, where a surgeon had to kind of go in, you were put under anesthesia, they had to open up and go inside your body to do an operation. People that are post-operative uh, after a surgery, they're at higher risk. And the fourth big group are uh, people that have had fractures for some reason. So bone fractures of whatever type, there's a very high risk of fracture after having had, uh, 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 excuse me, a high risk of blood clots after having had a fracture. So there's a bunch of others also, but those are some of the big ones why somebody can develop a blood clot. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I actually myself wasn't very um, familiar with the fact that an autoimmune disease could um, put you at a higher risk for a blood clot. Um, and so are you touched on um, mobility and after like having had a procedure done, those types of people, are there ones that are higher at risk versus lower at risk? Or um, once you have a procedure done, what sort of preventative measures are taken so the patient does not develop a blood clot? Yeah, great question. So, and uh, to your point is that not all surgeries cause equal risk of clot. So uh, cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, so some kind of spine procedure, brain operation, that group. Thirdly, orthopedic surgery, hip replacement, knee replacement, you know, fracture repair surgery. Those three big groups are the highest risk for having a blood clot post-operatively. Uh, as opposed to, let's say somebody has an appendix removed, that's considered relatively lower risk. And there's still some risk, but it's not nearly as high as like in orthopedic surgery or cardiac surgery as far as a clot happening post-operatively. So th those uh, people that have had those kind of surgeries, they're at higher risk. And as an example, as a hematologist, as a blood specialist, uh, and just for the audience is that blood specialists are called hematologists uh, in case you see that word or you're trying to get an opinion from the, the right kind of doctor, you know, who specializes in it. But the, the what I will consult with with patients is that I will get referrals often from surgeons that say, hey, this patient has a history of blood clots or some kind of condition, and they're worried about the risk of a clot after the operation. So then they'll ask, you know, myself and, you know, colleagues like myself, you know, hematologists, what should we do as far as ways to kind of diminish risk of blood clots? So, uh, you know, like you were saying, what can people do? So one big thing is, after the operation, as soon as a surgeon says it's safe to do so, 
get up, be active, rehab, whatever may be appropriate for the individual uh, situation. So that the surgeon will let you know when is the green light to start, you know, normal activity and all that. So normal activity, just getting the blood going, blood flowing, that sort of thing, as people say, um, that that does go a long way. Blood flowing help prevent blood clotting. So the more your blood is flowing nicely, your muscles are going, you're exercising and all that, that goes a long way. The second thing is uh, when people are not able to go as, uh, you know, walk around as much, some people will be recommended medications, which we generally call blood thinners. The medical term is anticoagulants. Uh, of course, you know, as a pharmacist, but uh, just as a uh, in general for the audience. But uh, so some people get blood thinners to try to temporarily, usually to try to prevent a blood clot or diminish the risk of a blood clot getting a blood thinner. And the third thing, some people, uh, patients may have had, or maybe you saw family members in the hospital at some point, where they had these kind of um, uh, wraps around their lower legs and they kind of like, they call them compression devices and they'll kind of like inflate, deflate, inflate, deflate, and that kind of thing. And so when they do that, it helps to kind of help the blood pump up from the legs because the legs are the most common site of a blood clot in the body. A blood clot can happen in many parts of the body and we can talk talk about that at some point if you wish. Um, but the blood, the legs are the most common place for a blood clot. So that's why they put those kind of things there, uh, those particular compression devices there uh, to decrease the risk for a patient. I always have to touch on um, things that are available right now to the main public where who are not patients. So you spoke about um, compression devices. There are a lot of businesses out there now that they do these compression devices and people just can have readily access to it. And um, you can just go and it's mo mostly geared towards um, athletes and people that work out a lot for recovery purposes. Right, are right. these something that you suggest for patients that think they're at a higher risk? Is that something that you would you think would be helpful or just mobility alone and the things that you touched on would be enough. Yeah, I mean, so as long as it's not a genetic factor we're talking about, if it's like just like a general person, they're worried about the risk for blood clot because of some reason, you know, you're not able to, um, you know, do something uh, like your mobility or some chronic autoimmune condition. I generally just recommend mobility. I don't recommend like a default, hey, go out and buy a compression device. I mean, like you said, Tanaz, I mean, you can go and get them, but I don't, think that most people need to do them. I mean, now the person, let's say who um, they have a, a really hard time walking because of bad arthritis. So some people will uh, elect to get these kind of devices. So compression uh, devices, sometimes even these kind of what they call compression stockings. So they're kind of like these like medical socks, essentially, these kind of like they, they go up the leg kind of like a really long like sock in a way, uh, but they are really tight. So the really tight part helps kind of squeeze the blood vessel and keep the blood kind of like helping it kind of go uh, up back towards the heart, you know, from the leg up to the heart. Now, the flip side of that is, uh, and that's why I tell patients and anybody who's had them can uh, appreciate it, they can be uncomfortable also. So usually people can't wear them for long periods of time anyway, because they're like these tight kind of like things around your legs. So most people, you know, it's not like a regular cotton sock that will be nice and flexible. This will be quite tight around the leg. So people can feel pretty uncomfortable. So some people will do it for a few hours or at nighttime only or something like that to kind of, um, you know, keep it tolerable. But like, but again, you know, generally I just say, mobility, get around, even if it's around the house, walking around the house, going up the stairs, if you can, uh, walking around the yard or, you know, down the street, all those things can are na very natural, but effective ways of helping out. Wonderful. Um, speaking of compression sto uh, socks and compression stockings, a lot of times people hear these things about, you know, flying when you're um, flying via air um, airplane and they are worried about because especially if it's a long trip they're right. worried about developing clots and how likely is it for pe people to have to be worried about let's say you're flying from here from Arizona to New York yeah. and it's a six hour flight you know is it very likely for you to get a DVT if you don't have other comorbid conditions other um, issues that could cause that um, should everyone, everyone invest in compression stockings when they're traveling? 
Yeah, so I, the general uh, thing is uh, everybody does not need to invest in compression stockings when traveling. Um, and the same, and, but you're right. So one of the other risk factors I didn't mention earlier, but I'm glad you brought it up is people that are doing long travel. And when we say long travel medically, what we mean is at, at least about five to six hours or longer. So Arizona to New York is a good example, like a cross country flight or international flight to Europe or Asia or South America, for example, that would be an example of a more of that six, 10, 12 hour kind of flight. So uh, long flights or long travel, like just you're going on a long road trip. Somebody says, oh, I'm gonna travel, I'm gonna drive 12 hours to wherever, you know? Uh, you're going to Texas or something. And so that would be an example of uh, the same idea. You're stuck in kind of like this sitting position for a long, long time. So the in an airplane, uh, uh, what I say, instead of like, instead of just getting compression devices left and right, uh, you know, some people may like to do it, that's fine. But generally, just getting up, peri- number one, getting up periodically, you know, when you're allowed to on an airplane, because you're not often you know allowed to just walk around. But when you can, that's good. Even if, and people say, well, how often should I do it? So I tell them that even if you can do it like once every hour to two hours, that should be good. You know, like you walk down the aisle, you go to the restroom, you come back, you just kind of like stretch the legs a little bit, kind of imagine you're flexing your calf muscle. So the, all those kind of things are natural ways to get the blood circulating, uh, the uh, uh, flexing your calf muscle. That flexion of the muscle squeezes the blood vessels that are there in the leg too. So that's the reason that's recommended. When you're in your seat, you can also kind of like move your legs, like, you know, kind of imagine almost like a nervous kind of like habit, you know, you're like, you know, just moving, shaking your leg or like uh, making your foot go up and down, for example, or making your foot kind of like go in circles, like around the, you know, the ankle. So those are uh, uh, simple ways, even in your seat in the airplane, you can do that or in a car, you know, seat in a car or airplane, you can do that as well. But those are some nice ways to kind of like decrease the risk. Now, and the last uh, point is about, well, w- what's the risk we're talking about, you know, in general? Like if you fly from Arizona to New York or, uh, you know, to wherever, Europe, uh, w- what's the risk of a blood clot? So it's still, the risk is generally considered less than 10%. So it's not a high, high, it's not like there's a 50% chance you're going to get a blood clot, you know? So because it's still relatively low, you know, arguably people, some people say 5%, 7%, or, you know, 3 it can vary a little bit. The general adult population risk in America, just in for all people to get a blood clot, is a, a little bit less than half a percent. Okay, so it's pretty low overall. But when you consider like 330 million people in the country, it adds up to you know a, a good number of people every year. Roughly a million people get diagnosed in America with a blood clot. A million. I mean, it's pretty staggering. Um, that it, so, but just because the the country has such so many people, but. Uh, but ho- so hopefully that helps to clarify. But it's a great question because that's one of the most common scenarios where you don't have a medical condition, but you take a long trip somewhere and then you're like, oh, how did I get a blood clot? You know, uh, but like you said, this is why it can happen. It's interesting because I do that exercise anytime I'm uh, traveling. I besides just walking when I'm sitting, I just lift my foot up and yeah. down. So I get like kind of like calf raises where there's a lot of a little bit of movement and I try to flex and do all of these things myself. Um, so that's great. I'm, uh, I'm glad we talked about that. Um, so now that we talked about who is at risk and all of these things. So how should um, if let's say you just randomly end up having a clot, what are some of the signs that the average person can kind of um, notice uh, before it get to uh, an emergency situation? Yeah. So so the main symptoms will be, uh, so first of all, where you're feeling it. So the most common location for a blood clot is the legs, either leg, left or right. Second most common is in the arms. It can also happen elsewhere in the body as well. But the legs and legs are the most common location. So the here's the key to remember. If you have leg swelling, so let's say you no, don't normally have swelling in your leg, suddenly you develop leg swelling. You don't have a reason why it happened. There wasn't an injury. There wasn't something that occurred. You can't uh, attribute a reason to it. And if it persists for uh, at least one day, then definitely ask for medical advice. So uh, similarly, people might have swelling with pain. Sometimes it's swelling without pain. It could also be swelling with pain. So if you have swelling in the leg, either leg, 
uh, that goes on for most of the day, definitely if it goes on for more than 24 hours. And if it has pain, or even if it doesn't have pain and you have unexplained swelling, take that seriously, get it checked out. You know, um, the other classic symptom is that uh, the surprise to some people will be like, well, only one leg is swollen, you know, because usually people don't get a blood clot in both legs simultaneously. It'll just be one. So because when you see if you see leg swelling in yourself uh, in just one leg or one arm and it goes on for most of the day or into the next day, definitely take it seriously and ask for medical advice, especially if you have no idea why it happened. If you if you can't say, oh, well, there wasn't like you did anything that could have possibly caused that to happen. So that would be the main symptom to look for. And so, as I said, take it seriously. If it goes on for even like a day and you have no answer, but generally speaking, you want to ask for uh, a proper medical evaluation. And then that clot, when it comes to pulmonary embolism, that clot will move from your leg. So it always initiates in the leg. Is that correct? Or am I well, it, it generally initiates in the leg, but it doesn't always initiate. So the, now the when we talk about blood clots in general, so strokes are one kind of blood clot. Some people can get heart attacks from blood clotting conditions because blood clots can block an artery around that feeds into your heart. So lungs can also get it sometimes where the lungs can be the initial site of a clot. But you're totally right, Tanaz, that usually it starts in the leg and then a piece of the clot will break off and travel through your veins up to your lung. And then the symptom of a lung clot, which is called a pulmonary embolism or PE, is that people will feel pain when they take a deep breath. They feel short of breath. They feel like they can't take a deep breath. They feel like they have to breathe, they're breathing fast or can't, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're short of breath. Some people say short winded is a common uh, kind of phrase in North Carolina, for example, where I uh, work. And so if you feel that way, uh, where you feel like uh, you can't take a deep breath, you're short of breath, you're having pain when you try to take a deep breath. Um, and other signs can also be you can have fever without reason. So some people can have a fever with feeling short of breath, which it doesn't have to be a blood clot, but that's one of the things we think about medically. And the last thing is uh, often the heart rate becomes quite fast if somebody has a lung blood clot. So you'll feel like your heart is racing. So if you feel one of those kind of five symptoms or notice these things in yourself, that could be a sign of a lung blood clot, a pulmonary embolism. Wonderful. So, and to just kind of take the anxiety out, let's say you are, you are experiencing something like this, just to take the anxiety of having to go to the doctor and what to expect, what happens? Uh, so they go to the doctor, they go to the um, hospital. Well, it's not warranted for them to go to the hos a hospital if they have, uh, if they're feeling those symptoms. Do, or yeah. Do, so I would say uh, in, in my general advice would be two buckets, you know, one is that if it's in the legs, and if you have a doctor, you know, a primary clinic that you guys see uh, for, you know, your general health care, go there because nowadays 90 percent of cases, they don't have to go to the hospital. So most people wind up being able to be diagnosed as an outpatient, get on the right treatment, and then they'll be well on their way without having to go through a hospital stay. That's different, by the way, from a generation ago when, when like when I was in medical training about 20 years ago, uh, it was routine where people would be admitted initially for blood clot treatment because our medications we had back then were way different um, in terms of how we, when we start the medicine, you have to give an intravenous first. There were things that were different back then, as I'm sure you know, Tanaz, uh, 20 years ago. But, um, but so generally you don't have to go, if you have lung symptoms, you know, a breathing difficulty, hearts racing, uh, can't, you know, take a deep breath without pain, then I would say, go to the emergency room or at least the urgent care because that could, the the lung blood clot could make you much much sicker compared to like a leg blood clot a leg blood clot a piece could break off and go to the lung but if you go to the doctor go to the clinic in time then you might be able to get on treatment quickly before it ever that ever happens where it ever breaks off and goes to the lung so and so when when you go to the doctor and you have these symptoms, what do they do? They do they scan you? How do they scan you? Is it invasive? Is it non-invasive? Is it scary? Not scary? So how do they go about it? Yeah, a great. I mean, and, and like you said earlier, and I, I'm glad you mentioned it, uh, you know, one of the things 
it's understandable that people hear blood clot, they might be scared or oh, well, how are they going to find it? You know, so it can sound you know quite scary. I mean, um, which, you know, in a way it is. Uh, so the diagnosis is almost always non-invasive. So usually an ultrasound test will be enough to diagnose a blood clot in the leg, which is what we call a DVT, you know? And so that will be nothing invasive, just like, a, you know, they put that like jelly kind of area on the skin. They use the ultrasound device. If you've ever seen an ultrasound device, uh, any any woman who's gone through uh, pregnancy will know what an ultrasound is, for example. So the same kind of technology that uh, is used for ultrasound elsewhere in the body weaves down there. There's a few technical differences, but basically that's what it is. And that way they'll know, okay, you have a blood clot or not, you'll get a diagnosis promptly. And then the physician or, you know, other, you know, nurse, et cetera, will be aware right away. And then they'll talk to you about the right kind of treatment strategy for uh, your case. Wonderful. And um, is are there any skin there? I've seen some things um, for um, scanning the full body. Are there any scans that you suggest anybody do preventatively? Is it part of protocol to do any sort of preventative measures for patients that don't know if they're at risk? Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting question. I mean, in general, the answer is no. You don't have to do like a preventative kind of scan. I mean, in theory, somebody could go and say, oh, I want to get an ultrasound done and this and that. But in general, it's, it's not worth it. I mean, uh, if I would uh, encourage people to say, okay, if you have symptoms, then of course, get it checked out. The other way, sometimes if you're in the family history genetic risk bucket, uh, you know, group of patients, that could be different. There are some, I see some patients who have genetic conditions, inherited conditions that put them at very high risk of blood clots, where their risk is totally different from the normal population, you know, and to give you an idea how different the general population risk is compared to genetic conditions, the general population risk of getting a blood clot for adults in America is about a little bit less than half a percent, like I said earlier. But for genetic conditions, it can be anywhere from 10 percent to 50 percent you know, or higher. Uh, the highest genetic uh, risk factors is up to 90% that at some point in your life, you'll get a blood clot. So to give you, an, uh, just to give you a big picture idea why it's quite different for genetic uh, inherited cases. So when people have an inherited case of a blood clotting condition, then that's a little different where we won't scan by default as a hematologist, but we will recommend certain blood tests to try to look for, is there any sign of abnormal clotting or excess clotting happening at the moment of the blood test. So there's some blood tests that we can check for those people. But again, as you guys uh, heard earlier, um, it's it's uh, just the it's the minority that are in the genetic group. Usually it's not because of a genetic factor or inherited factor why somebody might get a blood clot, typically speaking. Wonderful. Then um, that kind of brings me to the end of my questions. Do you feel like there's anything that I we should share still with our patients um, that you find might be valuable for them to know before we move on? I think the, the last main thing I would like to just uh, mention is that because I hear this kind of fear a lot from patients about blood thinners as a treatment. So the because a, a lot of the historical blood thinners that we used in the past were quite different compared to what we use currently. So in other words, uh, the blood thinners we use right now, they tend to be overall quite safe. There are some risk factors like we have to look for signs of bleeding, but generally it's quite safe. So the uh, blood thinners that we use nowadays are very well tolerated. Their risk of uh, complications is very low. The main risk is bleeding, but that's why physicians will monitor people on blood thinners. But blood thinners are uh, uh, you know, typically a pill medication, very it, overall, very safe, easily, you know, monitored by doctors and, you know, clinics, very different from the blood thinners that we used to use a generation ago. Because some people, uh, and I say this because I get this uh, all the time from patients. Well, you know, I heard some blood thinners are what we used to call rat poison, you know. So there were older blood thinners that are still available, but older blood thinner types that we use since like the 1950s and 60s that were like a uh, kind of like a, a less uh, potent version of a, a rat poison. But nowadays, those kind of medicines are very, very rarely used compared to what we used to do. So just to kind of like hopefully put people at ease a little bit that even if you have it, if you get diagnosed and you get on modern blood thinners, which are not like the rat poison stuff or anything like that, your chance of successfully getting the blood clot treated 
very, very good. I mean, I tell patients that if you're if you get diagnosed, you know, promptly, you know, you, you come to come to the doctor to get diagnosed promptly, get on the right treatment quickly, which will typically happen same day, you know, then the patient should be well on their way to recovery, even though it takes a few months to, for the clot to dissolve, but you'll be well on your way to recovery. So the prognosis is very, very good once you get diagnosed and on the right treatment. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all the wonderful information. Um, I learned definitely, I, and I have a medical background, so I definitely uh, learned a lot today, and I hope uh, that our patients um, learn, uh, you know, it put their mind at ease. Um, our patients do have the opportunity to send in questions, so if I do get any questions, I will definitely um, send them your way so you can answer them uh, kindly. And again, thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your day. I know you're very busy. No, no problem at all. My Really my pleasure to join you on the discussion and I hope the public finds it useful because this is a common condition, common, you know, questions that come up. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come and discuss it, you know, for uh, general public education. So my pleasure, Tanaz, and, uh, and any questions, I'll be more than happy to do my best to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.